In this video, we're going to talk about writing procedures in Scheme. So before we start, let's talk about what a procedure looks like in a functional language. In the imperative languages you've seen in the past, such as C, or also like C++ or Java when you're actually writing methods, you see some sort of, you've probably seen some sort of structure like this, which would be an imperative style where you set a variable equal to something, pass that as a parameter to a procedure, then assign the result to another variable, and then do it again for your final result would be the result of passing your previous result as a parameter to a new function. So in functional style programming, the way you would perform the calculation above is you would calculate the result of changing something. And so you can see the structure is a little bit different. And of course, you could, you could use this type of structure in an imperative language. It's just a matter of avoiding the use of variables to hold your intermediate values. So if you remember from our last video, we had these two defines x to be 10 and y to be 20. We'll copy those into this new file as well. And now we're going to start writing procedures. So if I just say times 3x, that's a scheme form. And when I run my code, you can see I get 30, which is the result of multiplying, applying this operation to these two operands. Now I can create a procedure in Scheme using Lambda. So it's going to have one parameter X and the result is going to be three times X. Now, remember when you hover over something in Scheme, it'll tell you where it's defined. So X here is defined by the define statement above and things like this operator define that comes from the scheme language, as does Lambda. But here, when I hover over this X, you can see that that's the parameter that's being passed in. Now we call this an unnamed procedure. And you may ask, well, what does an unnamed procedure do? And it basically just exists. It's, it's there, it's a procedure, but it doesn't have a name. It evaluates to a procedure and that's it. If we want to actually use this, we need to use the result of this form as an operand, and then we'll pass an operand. In this case, we'll do five. So if I run this, you can see this returns three times five. I can also pass in X. Now this gets kind of complicated. Notice this X is the parameter to the unnamed function. This X is actually the X that we defined above because the scope of that X here is just inside the Lambda function itself. So this, this X is only in scope inside the Lambda. Once I'm outside the Lambda, now I'm back in my global scope. So if I run this, this returns 30, which is three times 10. Now you may say that's not very useful, or at the very least, it's very tedious to have to type out the function you want to use each time. Well, remember we have define, which applies a name to a form. Here we used very simple self-evaluating forms, but there's no reason we can't do something like this. Define trip to be lambda x times 3, 3, or times 3x, I should say. And once this is done, this now allows us to do things like, well, first off, let's just type trip and see what happens. But then we can say trip 5 trip x. And when I do that, you'll see trip is a procedure and I used it on five and X and I got 15 and 30. So let's break this apart just so that we can see what's happening here. So this define statement associates a name with a form. What form is it going to associate with? Well, it's going to associate with this Lambda that defines a procedure. So now trip is now associated with this Lambda form. This entire form associates the name trip to this Lambda expression so that when we call it in our global scope, you can see that it now acts like a procedure or an operator. So we talked last time about atoms. So now let's define a predicate. Remember a predicate is just a procedure or primitive that returns true or false based on whether some factor is true or not. So in this case, we're going to define a, pre a predicate 
that's going to check if a value is an atom. So we'll define atom. And again, there's nothing magical about the question mark. We just use that to indicate that that's the name of our function and predicates by convention end in a question mark. So we're going to associate that name atom to a lambda with just one parameter. And it's going to re return the result of anding if something is not a pair and if it's not null. And notice I want to make sure that my parentheses line up. So let's ask if some things are atoms. We'll ask if three is an atom. We'll ask if a string is an atom. We'll ask if a symbol is an atom. We'll ask if a cons pair is an atom. And finally, we'll ask if a list is an atom. We'll talk about those in the next video. So let's run this and see what our result is. And we can see that we have three atoms and two non-atoms. But now what if we want to define a procedure with two parameters? So I'll define a function called atom, not to be confused with atom. It'll have two parameters, A and B. I could use X and Y there if I wanted and it's going to return a plus b. So I'll add x and y. Remember those were defined above. I'll also add 10 to atom of 20 and 30. And here you can see here's atom and there's my results. 10 plus 20 is 30, 10 plus 20 plus 30 is 60. I can write a function to increment a number. I start off with define, the name, and then my lambda structure. Again, I pass, I'm gonna have one parameter x, and I'm gonna add x to one to be my result. So now if I increment eight, I get nine, and I can even do something like this. I can increment zero four times recursively and I get four. So functions in scheme work very differently from other languages you may have seen in the past. So we can have a function as a parameter. So I can define do and it's going to be associated with a lambda form that has two parameters, this and that. And we're going to do this to that. So if I say do increment 10 or do minus 20, you can see that I get 11 when I increment 10. I get negative 20 when I do minus 20. I can trip 27. I can do integer 8. I can even do lambda x times x and x plus 1. So now I've passed this unnamed procedure to do, and I'll operate on the parameter 3. And so you'll notice my results. If I triple 27, I get 81. 8 is an integer. And when I apply this lambda function that says x, uh, that returns x times x plus 1, I get 12 when I pass the parameter 3. Now, what about this? Do 10, 20. Notice there I get applications on a procedure. This first thing has to be, the first parameter has to be a procedure. And 10 is not a procedure, so I'll comment that out. So now what about this? Do atom one. Here I'm gonna get an arity mismatch because atom takes two parameters and I only passed it one when I made this call. 
So I can't do that either. And when we talk about the area of, the, of a function, we're talking about how many parameters it takes. Now, if I want to use Atom, I can put it in a Lambda like this. And now I've converted Atom, which takes two parameters, to a, an unnamed procedure that only takes one. And now when I run this, you can see I get 101. And you'll notice I lose some flexibility because I, I'm forcing that second number to always be 100. But that's one way I can get Atom to work inside that function do. So just as a quick review of some conditionals before we start writing functions with those, I can say if 3 is greater than 2, return bigger, otherwise return smaller. And if I reverse the direction, I should get the opposite answer. And so there, 3 is bigger than 2, and here, 2 is smaller than 3. So I can put those conditionals in more complicated statements. So here, if x is equal to 10, I'm going to add 5 to 10. Actually, I'm going to add 5 to x. Otherwise, I'm going to do trip x. And then if x is equal to 12, I'll do the same thing. Now, x is defined above as to be 10. So we should expect that in this case, the true case will be exercised, this one. And in this case, the false case will happen, which is this one. So let's run this. And you can see x is 10, so it adds 5 to it. Here, x is not 12, so it multiplies it by or it calls the trip function, which multiplies it by 3. So there's also something like a switch statement or a case statement. So I'm going to define director and I'm going to have a conditional here. And here's my conditions. And here are my conditions. So for each one of these conditions, there's something I'm checking. So here I'm checking to see is k equal to Goodfellas, and if so, the director is Martin Scorsese. If k is equal to Inception, then the director is Christopher Nolan, and so forth. Now, I don't think I want to use equal, equal here. I want to use equal, just in case those strings um, are not the same object. And then, finally, I have a default case, else. And in that case, Alan Smithy would be the return value. So I can ask for the director of aliens. I can also ask for the director of CSC 240, the movie. And when I run that, you can see that it gives me the correct response. We're going to use these conditionals to write more complicated procedures. We'll jump right in and start writing recursive procedures. So I can write factorial. I'll define fact to be a lambda. And if n is less than or equal to 1, and above I put these all on one line, but I'm actually going to put them on separate lines here just so it's a little easier to read the syntax. I'm going to return 1 in that case. Otherwise, I'm going to multiply n times factorial of n minus 1. So let's run this. Now, if you ran factorial 100, or even, uh, certainly 1,000 in Java, you would not get the correct answer, which is, as it turns out, it's this number. Remember that in Scheme, you can have a fairly arbitrarily high number of digits in, your, in the numbers you work with. Now, I can also do this tail recursively. There, I'm going to define or I'm going to associate the name fact tail to this lambda. But actually, this lambda is just going to call my fact tail helper with n and 1. And then I'll define fact tail helper. I'll have two values. 
n and an accumulator. That's where we're going to keep our result. And if n is less than or equal to 1, we're going to just return the accumulator. Otherwise, we'll make a recursive call where we subtract 1 from n and multiply the accumulator times n. So I can call fact tail there, and you can see I get a relatively big number. Let's go ahead and comment this out. So I haven't really found a, a limit where this eventually crashes, especially this tail recursive one, since it's not really as much of a memory hog. It does eventually start slowing down once you start using your stack space, but we have in class one time done 10, to, uh, actually we did 100,000 one time, and it did actually eventually return a result although it did take a while. It also took a long time to print that many digits. So this is a quick introduction to creating procedures in Scheme. In our next video, we'll do a quick introduction to lists, and that'll prepare us for the next module where we will focus on recursive list procedures.